Welcome boys and girls to the flip class video. This is your video to watch as homework over the weekend to get you ready to do our flipped lab on Monday. So this lecture is going to focus primarily on interactions within the community. So we've talked about where the communities are and how they got to be the way that they are. So now we're going to talk about how they uh, interact with each other because that's what a community is really all about, is about the interactions between the different populations. So there's several different ways that uh, organisms can interact with each other. But one big way is what we call symbiosis. Now, sim is where the means together, and then bio, obviously, is for living. So this is different ways that things live together. And when we say live together, that means like in really tight association. It's usually something along the lines of living on or inside of another organism. There's mutualism. Mutualism is a type of interaction that's symbiosis. And that is, then there's commensalism. And then there's also parasitism. Now here's mutualism. You have a pretty picture with a uh, bee all hanging out on a flower. And that's a really good example of mutualism. So mutualism is a situation where you have two organisms living together and they are both benefiting. So when you have mutualism, it's a mutual benefit for both. Here, the bee and also the flower are both benefiting from this situation. That's mutualism. Now there's also commensalism. Commensalism is a type of symbiosis where one organism benefits and the other one is mostly unaffected, just sort of hanging out. Good example, Nemo's papa living in the sea, anemonemonemony. He is just hanging out. They don't actually live there. Uh, that would actually kind of stink because sea and enemy have really nasty stingers. They have these microscopic nematocysts and just stamp the crap out of you and inject neurotoxin. But anyway, uh, they don't live there. They hide there. But it's good for the clownfish because nothing wants to go inside of an enemy. It'd be like, hey, let me just sting myself a million times. But it's good for the clownfish. And the anemone is pretty much unaffected. It's just like, oh, okay, there's a clownfish. What else? Yo. So that's commensalism, where one benefits and the other is just sort of like, Meh. Parasitism is another fun one, and you've probably already like, oh, this picture of the parasite down there. We'll talk about that in a minute. Parasitism is obviously the relationship where one organism is benefiting, and it's at the expense of the other one. The other one is called the host organism. We call it the host organism because, quite frankly, the host is the organism that is harmed. So it's easy to remember the host is harm. Now the host should not die. In fact, the end result of most parasitism, it should evolve into commensalism or even mutualism. A lot of times these organisms evolve together. Good example for you is you actually have parasites inside your body all the time, some more than others, but many people that have been infected with certain types of parasites no longer experience allergies. The body has sort of worked out this equilibrium. If you have really, really bad allergies, it could be because your body is bored, needs something to assault, maybe you should get yourself a parasite. This is kind of a cool one. These are parasitoid wasps. It's a type of species called brachinoid wasps, and they actually live all over the surface of the caterpillar right here and lay their eggs inside of it, and then what actually happens is the caterpillar is going to die. And because the host dies, not just harmed, not just at a disadvantage, because the host dies, it is not parasitism, it's parasitoidism. Another type of interaction is competition. Now competition is America, it's supposed to be a good thing. Uh, however, it could be different species, could be same species, it's any time two different individuals have the same niche. Now niche has always been described probably like the job that an organism has in the environment. However, it's really, it's a lot more than just its job, it's everything about what it does and what it needs in that environment. So it's like its whole like profile of what it does, what resources it needs, when it mates, what it eats, how it likes to eat it, all that is the niche. And anytime you have the same niche or an overlapping niche with another individual, there's going to be competition because there's not really uh, enough stuff to go around. So anytime you know you have competition, it's actually going to be a disadvantage for both organisms, right? They're expending energy, trying to get these resources, trying to, you know, select a mate, etc. 
that it could be used otherwhere, like growing or hunting or doing other things other than competing. And so it actually puts both organisms participating at a disadvantage, which is kind of a bummer. Now, there's also reproduction. There's two main types of reproduction. There's asexual reproduction, where essentially you have a clone of the parent come out. And that one goes really, really quickly. Uh, bacterium microscopic organisms do it. Some actually have the power, like strawberries, can do asexual reproduction and make perfect clones where they send off runners, or they can do sexual reproduction. And in sexual reproduction, you have to have two parents. Sometimes with plants, there could be more, so two or more plant parents, and the offspring is a blending of all their genes together. The final type of interaction is predation. Predation is a really fun one. This is obviously one benefits and the other is totally like definitely super un not benefiting because you know the other one eats it. This relationship we often refer to as the predator prey relationship because the predator is eating the prey. It's all based on these feeding levels, these trophic levels. And you can see here is a food web that's showing you different trophic levels. So at the very bottom, we always have our producers, then we have our primary consumers that eat the producers, and then you also have secondary and tertiary, etc. consumers that are eating the lower level consumers. What it actually does is it cycles energy through the ecosystem. It's sending energy that comes from the sun and sending it through the entire ecosystem. Right? So here, the energy flow is displayed with an arrow. So it's not you know, showing like who's being eaten. Everybody, like kids always want to draw the arrow the wrong way. This actually shows that like right here was the grass. The energy from the grass is going into the rabbit. And then the energy from the rabbit is going into the fox. And then if the fox were eaten by say me, the arrow would be like that, showing that the energy from the fox is going into me. So here's a fun little food chain. And some of the ones, you guys have probably done food chains before, but it gets a little bit more complicated. You'll see, you know, we've got our sun, our source of energy, giving energy to our producer. Producer's energy goes to the primary consumer. The primary consumer's energy goes to the secondary consumer, and the secondary consumer's energy goes to the tertiary consumer. But, like we talked about yesterday, it's not just about energy, it's also about nutrients. And so how does the nutrients, how do they get cycled back through the environment. One of the big ways is with our decomposers. So our decomposers, they'll actually eat, this one's sort of showing like a linear because it's a food chain, but this one's showing you the energy from our top level going back, the nutrients get returned back to the producers. But to really make it complete, there should be arrows coming off of all these. Because any of these things, when they die, including the grass, are gonna be consumed by our decomposers. Decomposers like fungi and bacteria play a huge role in food webs. You cannot have an appropriate food web without the decomposer. And one of the reasons is because if you look at the amount of energy available in an ecosystem, the sun represents 100% of the energy that's available for that ecosystem. Now after you go up past the sunlight, you'll notice the primary producers Primary producers, those are the things that really take the energy from the sun and bring it to the rest of the ecosystem. They only have 10%. It's not that they lost 10%, it's that they only have 10% of the energy that was available ultimately. And then if you move up one more level to our primary consumers, they only have 10% of the 10%, and 10% times 10% is 1%. If you go up another level, you're going to lose more energy. I mean, look at this. We're down to 100 joules of energy. That's not even like a calorie. And that is actually going to be 0.1% of the energy available. And if you go up one more level to the tertiary consumer, I mean, I don't even know how they live. Of all the energy that was available in this ecosystem, the snaky up here has 0.01% of it available at that level. It's an energy pyramid because it looks like a pyramid. You see, every level you go up, you're actually losing 90% of the energy. You lose 90% of the energy, and that leaves you with 10% at each level. Each level has 10% of the level below it. 
And biomass goes the same way. I mean, every year it's the 90% rule. You lose 90% of the energy. Sometimes it's called the 10% rule because you only have 10%. So really, in terms of biomass, you can never have as many top-level consumers as you can have producers, which is really, really important because if you take out the bottom of the pyramid here, all of this is going to go with it. Kind of a nightmare. So what we guys are going to do now, you're actually going to make me some nice, beautiful food webs, but you're going to be doing it with your ecosystem and you're going to be doing it with the world's most extraordinary organism. So be prepared. There's a handout that you guys picked up on Friday in class. Make sure you read through it, knock out the pre-lab questions, come in ready to go on Monday. You're just going to get right to it. Thank you for watching the flip class video.